Good morning. Welcome to the Concord Church of Christ. Uh, thank you so much, especially to our guests who are with us today. Uh, you are so en uh, encouraging uh, to be here with us. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, today, we're going to uh, have a, another alternate theme as we have been doing on the first Sunday of the month, and today's theme is going to center around new creation. So I'm going to uh, ask you to think about something for a minute. Who here remembers the first nine months of their life? And I'm talking about pre-birth. Your first nine months, we, we don't remember that, right? And if you think about it, your existence during that nine months in the womb, or maybe you were a little early, but give or take nine months or so, is completely foreign to us. Like, we, we really don't have any memories of that. And then suddenly, like within minutes, you go from that existence, breathing liquid and being fed by a cord, to coming out and breathing air and just a completely new existence and making brand new memories. And I sometimes think someone had mentioned this before, that when we transition from this life to a life with God, it might be a similar transition, that uh, it will be a completely new existence, something completely different that maybe we can't even fathom. As we go through this uh, topic today of new creation, there are several different creations. There's one of our, our birth, our, when we were born, uh, certainly when we were baptized and we decided to put over, off the old person and put on the new person, which we're going to talk a lot about today. And then ultimately our new birth as we will exist in heaven. So be thinking about that as we go through our scriptures and songs today. The new creation is described in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, and it simply says, we're going to read it throughout the morning, but it says, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Paul tells us that believers who have died with Christ, they no longer live for themselves, but they live for him. Our lives are no longer worldly but they are spiritual. And our death is the old sinful person, our sinful nature, which was nailed to the cross. But now this new person is raised up with Christ and lives in newness. So I'd ask you to think on these things. Think of new creation as today we have many songs and scriptures, uh, passages that are going to help uh, emphasize this idea of new creation. Please join with us together today. If you're able, let's stand for this scripture reading and song. 2 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 7. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting on... If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that would we, we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are always away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Second Corinthians five fourteen through 16. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded thus. The one, that one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. And he died for all, that those who might live might no longer live for themselves but for him, who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been uni uh, united with him 
in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let no sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Would you bow with me? God, you are so great and so good, so loving, to provide an avenue for us to walk that does not lead to death, but leads to life in your Son. We thank you for the new life that we can live under the name of your Son. We ask that as we reflect on the words that you've given us this morning through your word, as we lift our voices together in unison, praising you, that you are glorified, and that we remember always this newness, this gift of life from your Son. We would be lost without you. It's because of your greatness and your goodness and your love that we get this chance to worship you, to be with you one day. God, please be with this church. As we walk in this community, as we're lights to this world, please be in our midst this morning so that we can edify each other and look like your son. It's in your, in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. John chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came into his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, but of the will of the flesh. I'm sorry, born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Put off your old self, which belongs to your, form, your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true holiness and in true righteousness and holiness, Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, 
slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Revelation 22, 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. Also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And no night will and night will be no more. There will they, they will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Isaiah twenty two seventeen through nineteen. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy, and her people to be a gladness. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be, be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. And then verses 24 through 25 of chapter 22. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy. In all my holy mountain, says the Lord. As we turn our minds to begin to think about the supper of our Lord, I want you to concentrate on two words. Those two words are chaos and order. Those two words, from the very beginning of God's story, we see them in a balance, if you will. God spoke creation into existence out of chaos and disorder. And when he did that, there was unity, there was shalom that came about, this harmony Amongst all things, heaven and earth were together. But sin brought chaos into creation. Sin separated God from humanity. And it also brought disorder into creation. Heaven and earth were were separated. God's dwelling place was no longer able to be with man's dwelling place. And we see decay and death become just a reality for all of humanity. We see significant times where this disorder is displayed. We see it in the flood. We see it at Babel. We see it in the plagues of Egypt where we might call them these decreation events where God allows disorder to fall back in. And we continue to see that. Because throughout our history, we see this movement of things going towards more disorder. We Scientists look at it and say, well, it looks like the universe is winding down going to more of disorder. Paul talks about it in a different way. In Romans 8, he says that creation is in bondage to corruption and futility. We might look at it and we see it around us. Look at the seasons. And we might say, well, wait a minute, the seasons seem to be ordered. They're in a cycle. They continue to keep going. But isn't it the the balance between Death and decay and new birth and order. Through God's story, though, he gives us the hope of something better. 
one of the most vivid images that, we, that I think we can find of that idea is in the book of Ezekiel. <clears throat> in Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel is shown a vision of a valley of dry bones. And God comes to him and, he's, and he says, Ezekiel, do you think these bones can live? To which Ezekiel responds, only you, Lord, can do that. And he tells Ezekiel, God tells Ezekiel to, to prophesy over these bones. And in so doing, Ezekiel begins to see these bones coming together, rattling together, and then muscles and tendons are, are being put on these bones, and, and these, these bones are coming to life. To which then God tells Ezekiel in verse 11, he says, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you into the land of Israel and you shall know that I am Yahweh. Open, open, or when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am Yahweh. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares Yahweh. That picture of as Israel was looking at things, just they, they felt like we're, we're cut off from everything. We are in exile. And especially as you look at that whole idea of exile, that is, a, in, in a sense, a picture of disorder because that's not the way that things were meant to be. And so God is saying the end of exile is really a picture of life from death. And we find that fulfillment in Jesus Christ. As he was raised from the dead, sin being an exile from God, by his sacrifice, we are brought out of that exile. We are brought out of that slavery to sin. Paul speaks of it in this way in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Speaking of Jesus, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was well pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Paul talks about Jesus as the firstborn, the firstborn of creation. But when he's talking about that, he's not talking about it in terms of time, as in the very first one born. He's talking about it in terms of the rights and the, the, the prerogatives that came with the firstborn. Because he is the one who created all things. And because he created all things, he is supreme over all things. That he made all, he made the universe and he is over it all. But then in that same way, he then says that he is the firstborn from the dead. Just as he is supreme over all creation, because of what he has done in his sacrifice and his resurrection, he is supreme over all who would be raised from the dead. You see, Jesus' death, his shedding of blood, and his resurrection didn't just bring about a new covenant, it brought about a new creation. 
that he is reconciling, as it says there, things on the earth and things in heaven. He's bringing things back together the way that God intended from the very beginning. Jesus brought about the beginning of a new existence where sin does not impact life. This verse has already been referenced. Paul says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and the new has come. He's talking about that because of what he has done, he is, it, it, it gives us the, the ability, it gives us the opportunity to be something completely different. That because of his death and his resurrection, we have been spiritually recreated. We've been made into something new. It's interesting because in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 28, this is where Peter, he's, he's looking out at, at everything and he says, Lord, we've left everything for you. What is there for us? And this is how Jesus responds. He says, truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That word regeneration is talking about a renewal of all things. I believe the English Standard Version actually says, calls it the new world. But what's interesting is that word is only used in the New Testament one other time. That is in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. Speaking there of Jesus saying, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 is the fulfillment of, of Ezekiel 37, when he is saying there that he is going to put his spirit within us, it is the spirit that recreates us, makes us completely new spiritually, puts a new heart within us so that the spirit dwells in us. Because of that, because of his sacrifice, we are a new creation but Christ's sacrifice didn't just forgive us of our sins. Because sin affected the whole of creation. Jesus then has to come and reconcile all of creation from the corruption and disorder. Christ's redemptive work not only saves us from our sins, but it breaks the bonds of slavery that all of creation is in. We referenced it before, but notice what Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 19 beginning. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Paul talks about here he says creation is not what it was meant to be it is suffering the effects of sin it's suffering the, the effects of disorder and chaos but it's longing to be set free paul's talking about now here the idea of the now but not yet that there is something that jesus has begun to do right now we are spiritually recreated, but we're looking for something even more. We're looking just as the creation is looking for the redemption of our bodies. 
He has established his kingdom. And he has done away with the power of sin. We have been brought into his kingdom. And we have been spiritually recreated such that sin no longer has power over us. But we wait along with creation for the time when heaven and earth will be brought back together. When there will be this new heavens and the new earth and we will have new bodies. You see, the supper that we're about to join together in is all about new creation. Because as we join together in this supper, as as Paul states in, in 1 Corinthians 11, we make a proclamation. He says, when you join in this supper, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now think about that. That means that we're not looking just back in history to what Jesus did. We also look forward because as we proclaim in this meal, he is not dead. He is alive. And because he is alive, we wait anxiously for his return so that we can realize the full new creation in the new heavens and the new earth. That's what he offers to us. Let us dwell upon this. Let us think about the shalom that we will have with all in the new heavens and the new earth as we dwell together in this supper. Holy Heavenly Father, we come before you as your children, as those who love you because you have first loved us. We come before you, Father, recognizing that we do not have what it takes to live a life as you have called us to. We come before you, Father, mourning our sin, realizing that we have fallen desperately short and we are in need of your mercy. We come before you, Father, hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of your Son. We come before you, Father, meekly, in gentleness of spirit, just as your Son came to us, that though he was God in the flesh, though he was the one who created this world and this entire universe, though he was the one for which this universe was created, through him and for him and by him, And yet, Father, he came meekly as a servant, as a sacrifice. Though, Father, he dealt a death blow to the adversary, as predicted in Genesis 3, as prophesied in Genesis 3. Though he was the very culmination of the promises given to Abraham, He was the blessing that was for all the nations of the earth. Though he was the peace prophesied by your servant Jacob, Father. Though he was the king with an eternal kingdom promised to David. He came of one lowly in heart, trusting, giving all to you, 
submitting himself to your will. And as a result, Father, you have freed us. For while we were dead in our sins and in the uncircumcision of our flesh, you made us alive with Christ, having canceled out the handwriting that was against us, that was opposed to us. You took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. Glory be to you, Heavenly Father, that in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that we can be renewed into your arms, into your family, into the life that you have intended us to have and to be. Thank you, most holy God, through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Our mighty God, we know that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. We know, Father, that the blood of bulls and goats is insufficient. And so you sent your Son. God in the flesh. We know, Father, that the priests of old used to come into the Holy of Holies once a year and present blood first for their own sin and then sin of the people. But now, Father, your Son, the perfect one, brought his own blood into the Holy of Holies and presented it on our behalf. Father, we are grateful for this reminder. We are grateful of this covenant that we find within the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that he partakes of this with us in this hour, Father. as our Lord, as our Savior, as our Master, and as our brother. We thank you for the blood of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being with us today. I hope that uh, one thing that you can take away from uh, our time together today, it is no longer I who live, no longer you who live, but it's Christ who lives in us. Uh, I know I need a constant reminder of that uh, through my own selfishness, my own wants and desires. Uh, sometimes it's hard to put those aside and think of it's Christ who lives in me. If anyone would like to uh, ask for prayers or have the elders pray with you today, we'll have that opportunity at this time. I'd invite you to stand as we sing together, Christ Lives in Me. <laughs> 